Right, welcome to the second of this week's videos. Uh, so we've just looked at objectivity and now we're going to look at universality in science. So here's a recap of where we've got to so far, just for those of you who are trying to draw the grand thread through. This is our enlightenment vision of science. This is, this is what we're hoping for. And we started by looking at the scientific method and we realized that there are at least scientific methods and we're not sure if you follow or want to follow any of them. Uh, having started on picking that, this Popper pointed out that this started to undermine certainty. Quine pointed out that this started to undermine demonstrability. And we realized that in picking which scientific methods we want to use and which science we want to pursue, we started to undermine objectivity. The science that you think is worth pursuing definitely depends on your opinions. And the opinions are not the same for all people. And as soon as we say, okay, it's not the same for all people, we're over on this side and we're starting to undermine universality. So this is where we got to at the end of the last lecture. And this lecture, we're going to look at universality, whether or not science is or should be or can be universal. So I'm going to start with something that seems like a reasonably universal scientific statement. If I hand you a hydrogen atom and I say this hydrogen atom is neutral, Okay, it doesn't matter what hydrogen atom I've handed you, a hydrogen atom that was created 10 billion years ago, or a hydrogen atom that I've just created now, a hydrogen atom that I got from my cornflakes this morning, or a hydrogen atom that I plucked from interstellar dust, this hydrogen atom will be neutral. Um, I can pull off one of the electrons and I can put a different electron on. I can give the hydrogen atom to your grandma. She might not understand it. She might not be able to particularly look at it because she left her mass spectrometer at home. But it's a universally true statement. It holds for all people at all times in all places. If you are holding a hydrogen atom, it's neutral. The electron is negative. The proton in the middle is positive. They have the same but opposite charges always, everywhere, exactly the same but exactly opposite charges. It's neutral. We're good. This is a good scientific universal statement. Science is universal in at least this instance. Now, what happens if I hand you a bar of chocolate and I say this chocolate bar is toxic? First of all, you might not eat it. But then you might say, well, for whom is it toxic? Is it, is it toxic for my grandma? When I'm going around to visit her this evening, the hydrogen atom was neutral for her, just like it was neutral for everyone else. Is this chocolate bar toxic for my grandma? And if it's a normal chocolate bar that you picked up from a shop, then the problem answer is no. But it might be toxic for your dog. Your grandma sits there quite happily chomping through chocolate, but your dog should not be given chocolate to eat. So the statement, this is toxic, depends on who you are talking about. For whom is it toxic? Okay, how about rabbits? I mean, don't feed it to your pet rabbit either. It will kill your pet rabbit, okay? Um, on the other hand, how about belladonna? Okay, it's also called deadly nightshade. The, uh, the clue is in the name. Anything that's called deadly nightshade is probably going to be toxic. Do not feed belladonna to your grandma. It will kill her. Um, also, do not feed belladonna to your dog. It will kill your dog. But for what it's worth, rabbits love it. They will sit in a field of it and they will chomp their way through it with no adverse effects whatsoever. Um, okay, moving on. How about peanuts? Okay, now I don't know what your grandma is like, but um, depending on your grandma's allergy to peanuts and propensity to go into anaphylactic shock, you might not want to feed peanuts to your grandma. Um, your dog almost certainly doesn't have a peanut allergy. People tend to have peanut allergies, uh, but dogs don't. They just they munch their way through chocolates uh, to through peanuts quite happily. Uh, you shouldn't feed peanuts to your rabbit though. It will make your rabbit fat. Uh, it won't go into anaphylactic shock. It'll just get fat. So the question of is this toxic is not a universal question. Um, there is nothing. There is no toxin which is toxic to all creatures. There is there is no universal toxin that will kill everything, and there is no creature for which everything is toxic. Fortunately, I mean, fortunately, because otherwise, you know, breathing becomes problematic if everything was toxic to it. But there's also no creature for which nothing is toxic. You know, you can find something which will kill the creature. So, the question of of what is toxic is always toxic relative to 
a particular organism. So we can ask ourselves the question, well, okay, can we make toxicology universal though? Because like toxicology, it seems like something that should be scientific, right? Toxicologists, they work in labs, right? They've got like pipettes and they wear lab coats and you get like toxicology scientific papers and things. So it, it feels like it should be scientific. I mean, it's also really important. Like saying this will kill you, like this vaccine is not safe, it's poisonous, right? That seems like a really important, relevant, significant thing that we have a reasonable handle on and we, we want to call it science. So can we make toxicology universal? Could we come up with a universal statement of toxicity? So belladonna, right? Rather than saying, okay, belladonna is going to kill you. Right. Can we? Okay. So any substance which contains atropines, because you know, I could I could genetically engineer belladonna so that it's not toxic and it would still be belladonna. It just wouldn't have any atropines in it, and it wouldn't. Right. So we're okay. But okay, but atropines don't kill rabbits. So okay. So and what if you didn't eat a whole lot? So if you don't eat much, then it just it just actually it changed. People used to take it as a medicine. It would make their skin nice and bright, and it would make their pupils dilate, um, which was considered attractive, not a precursor to killing them. So insufficiently high doses uh, to any organism in which such chemicals disrupt the nervous system. So for rabbits, they don't, so they can eat as much as they want. But for people where it does disrupt the nervous system, then you, it would be toxic. Um, or if it disrupted any other system which was necessary for life, you know, if there was some other creature where it disrupted cardiovascular system or something, okay, so it would be toxic for them. Um, unless, you know, maybe they'd evolve something so they could eat it and it did disrupt their nervous system, except that there was something else that said, well, they didn't need it to you know, they could cope with that for, and unless there was some other thing right you can see that as we go there's always an if but clause there could be some situation in which it might happen to not be universal for this uh, the toxic for this thing but then unless there was some other thing that made it unless there was now we're starting to feel like quine here so we had for under determinism we said okay there's this infinite number of caveats and extra statements that we need to make and for toxicity there's an infinite number of these extra statements we need to make. So we start to run into severe problems for trying to make toxicological statements universal. So I've attempted to make one here and it really got unwieldy after the first five or six lines. But let's let's consider this because these, these are serious problems. So first of all, it's not in principle possible to make a universal statement. Um, so Quine says, you know, you have an infinite number of extra caveats that you need to put in. So you can't do it if you have a finite amount of time in which to make your statement or a finite word limit on your toxicology paper. It's also not helpful. Um, if I make this statement that says any animal which in which the atropines lead to this effect, blah, will find any substance that contains atropines toxic well that may be true but then you leave really important questions like does belladonna contain atropines and do they disrupt my nervous system and what's a sufficiently high dosage and right so for all of these extra things you lay out that just brings the next question that says yeah but is it toxic to me can i eat this the thing i want to know is i want my scientific paper to say can i feed this to my granny and, and for all the extra caveats of, you know, provided this and provided that and given that, you still come back and say, right, that's the general, but give me the specific. Is my granny one of these people? So the more universal we make toxicology, actually, the more unhelpful the statements become. And unhelpful scientific statements. OK, maybe some of you think that scientific statements are generally unhelpful, but that's a whole other discussion. OK, either way, it's not helpful. And it's also not necessary. Um, people publish toxicology papers in scientific journals. Um, people get funding from science funding agencies to do toxicology. And they do this without having made universal statements, right? They make toxicology papers of finite length, which don't come with a full set of abstract uh, of, of, of caveats, right? They say, do not feed this to your dog, it's toxic. And that, although not a universal statement, is still considered sufficiently scientific to publish in a scientific journal. So making it universal, even if we could, isn't necessary to make it counter science. So 
the logic of this, let's look at the logic of what's happened, okay? So we started off, if we said, okay, science makes universal claims and toxicology makes particular claims, which means toxicology is not science. Now, we're just going to follow where the logic leads for a minute and we'll, we'll, we'll fit this into the grand picture in a minute. But, but if, if in our enlightenment vision, science, we insisted science made universal claims and the evidence of our eyes says toxicologists don't and can't make universal claims, they have to make particular claims, then toxicology isn't a science. Right? But then we say that, that toxico toxicological claims are meaningful and they're important, right? Anyone that says stating whether or not this food will kill your granny is not an important thing to be able to say might not love their granny as much as they should, right? We really feel that knowing whether we're going to kill our granny by mistake is an important thing to know. Now, if we take that, these claims are important, but toxicology is not a science. Then we put those together and we say there are important things on which we have a handle, but which are outside the remit of science. Which means that if science claims are universal, then science itself is not universal because there are these claims which are meaningful and important, which don't fall under science. So one way or the other, we lose universality in science. Either science doesn't have to make universal claims or there are claims which are worth making, which don't fall in within science. So given we have to lose universality in science one end or the other, we now say, okay, well, I want science to be able to talk about things which are meaningful and important. So we face that toxicological claims are meaningful and important, and we think that important things on which we have a handle, on which we can do research, they should be scientific. It feels really like it should be scientific. So toxicology is science. And then we say that if toxicology is science and toxicology makes particular claims, then science doesn't need to make universal claims. So this is, like I said, we, we need to lose universality in science at one end or the other. And what people have chosen to do is they've said, OK, we're going to lose universality in as much as scientific claims. Each individual scientific claim does not need to be a universal claim. It can make particular claims. And we're OK with that. So what just happened, right? We've just rewritten what science can do. And we, not because it was, it was, you know, it was a grudging thing. We've embraced it. We said, yes, we're doing this, not because we have to make toxicology a science, but because we want to make toxicology a science. We want to change our understanding of science to include this thing because, because we want to, we, we are, we are drawing on this, not grudgingly, but, but joyfully saying, yes, this is a good thing and science should be like this. And so the thing that's just hit it is, is pragmatism. Okay, now toxicology is not strange in this regard. Some people say, okay, well, it's life sciences, you know, never trust biologists, right? Let's go for, you know, proper things like physics. Okay, they wouldn't be pragmatic. No, physicists go for the truth and what's hard and they just stick by the rules. Um, well, okay, so let's take a physics example. Okay, Newton. Uh, physicist, physicist. I mean, no one's going to argue that Newton wasn't a great physicist. Well, some people would, but I'm not going to, right? Now, he comes up with, with laws of motion, right? These are wonderful. These are universal. F equals MA, right? All forces are equal to the acceleration of your mass, okay? If you have a mass which is being accelerated, the force which is applied to it is equal to the product of those two. Nice universal statement. And the great thing about this is it's useful, Right, pragmatism says we want things that are useful. Toxicology, knowing if I'm going to kill my grandma, is a useful thing to know. And Newtonian mechanics was useful. It helps you explain the paths of the planets. It helps you know where your cannonball is going to land. And if you're living in Europe in a time riven by war, knowing where your cannonball is going to land is a useful thing to know. Um. Now, for what it's worth, if you look at Newton's writings, I mean, he's really famous for the ones on mechanics, but um, he also did a lot of um, alchemy. I mean, he, he was he was a, 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 an alchemist alchemist. Uh, he, he has large amounts of writing on alchemy where he said, right, you can transmute elements. You can change one element into another element. The elements are not fixed. If it started off as lead, it doesn't have to stay as lead. And, and 
this, you know, if you can turn lead into gold, I mean, this would be awesome. But in fact, what you do is you spend large amounts of money not getting anywhere. Um, and it turned out that his alchemy was just not useful. And so what we do is we say, okay, mechanics, this helps me know where my cannonball is going to land. This is useful. This is good, proper science. Whereas alchemy isn't useful. Trying to change one material into another and just ending up spending vast amounts of money for no results isn't useful to me. I can't make money out of that or overthrow my neighboring kingdom out of that. And it's no surprise, possibly, that it was considered to be occult, dark arts, magic, not science, right? I mean, this was this was buried, right? This is not part of Newton's scientific corpus. Now, now let's consider Einstein. Okay, Einstein, scientist, proper good scientist. Now, what did Einstein show? Einstein showed that you can turn one element into another. The elements are not fixed. You can turn uranium into barium and krypton, for example. So Newton was right. At the time, he didn't have the wherewithal and the apparatus to make this happen. He couldn't realize that, but he was right in his basic notion. But it wasn't counted as science at the time, not because it was wrong, but because it was not useful. Now, it looked kind of wrong, but it wasn't wrong. It was just not useful. It was thrown out because it wasn't useful. On the other hand, what did Einstein say about F equals MA? He said, no, F doesn't equal MA unless you do some very, very strange things to M, right? So Newton, when he's writing F equals MA, he was wrong. Einstein showed he was wrong, just as Einstein showed that in the basic principles of alchemy, Newton was right. But F equals MA was counted as science, not because it was right, but because it was useful. And so time and time again in science, and we can we can pick out some examples in, in the discussion maybe, time and time again in science, you see that science credits usefulness much more highly than it credits being right. So truth, the truth of a scientific theory comes second to the usefulness of a scientific theory. And similarly, as we saw with toxicology, the universality of a scientific theory comes a distant, distant second to the usefulness of a scientific theory. Hmm. Okay, my animations went wrong here, never mind. So what we can see here is that science then becomes a tool. If I have a hammer, whatever, oh, I left my hammer at home today. Never mind, okay, I've got a picture of it. Okay, so if I have a hammer, right? If I want to hammer in a nail, right? I use a hammer. I don't use a spirit level. Right? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a spirit level per se. Spirit levels are great. I'm not going to get rid of my spirit level because it's no good for hammering in nails. I'm just not going to use my spirit level to hammer in nails. On the other hand, if I want to work out whether or not my shelf is straight, I don't use my hammer. I use my spirit level. And so here we see with tools, there is no universal tool. When someone says, right, what's the right tool to use? You say, well, what do you want to do? If you want to hammer in a nail, the right tool to use is a hammer. And if you want to see if your shelf is level, the right tool to use is a spirit level. There's no, there's no universal tool that is the right tool to use always. I don't ask, is my hammer true? I say, does my hammer work to achieve the thing I'm trying to do? Now, similarly in science, if we say, okay, science is a tool. When I'm looking at air flowing over the wing of an aeroplane, I, I can treat my air as billiard balls. I can say, okay, it's a hard ball that's just bouncing off, off the wing and I can simulate that and it takes a reasonable amount of computing power and it lets me know what shape I should design my aeroplane wing. I don't ask, is it true that atoms are billiard balls? I say, is it useful to be able to design my aeroplane wing? And so when I'm designing an aeroplane wing, I treat atoms as billiard balls. On the other hand, if I'm trying to work out how atomic spectra work or what lines I would expect in my absorption spectrum, I don't treat atoms as billiard balls because it's a not a useful way to do it. Because if it's a billiard ball, then I don't get any atomic spectra whatsoever. Then I treat it as this complex thing with wave functions in, right? As shown with the pretty pictures down the bottom here, right? So then why don't, given this is, 
more true, this, this wave function picture of atoms is significantly more true than a billiard ball function picture of atoms, as far as we understand at the moment, right? So well, I say, well, why don't I use this wave function picture of atoms to, 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 to design an airplane wing? And the answer is because it's not useful. The computing power I would need, if I'm considering it as a wave function, is far beyond what I can reasonably do to design an airplane wing. And it's far beyond what I reasonably need because I don't need that level of thing. So in designing an airplane wing or in designing uh, a, a spectrum or understanding a spectrum of things, I don't care what is true about my atoms. I care what is useful to be able to get a handle on the effect at which I'm looking. So, and just as there is no universal tool in my toolkit that does everything I want to do for putting up shelves, we should therefore expect there's no universal science that does everything we want, no universal way of looking at the world. It depends on what you're trying to work out in the world. So recap of where we've got so far. We started with the scientific method and that came unpicked. Uh, we moved on to objectivity and that came unpicked. Uh, we then moved on to universality and that came unpicked. So next up, we're going to be looking at, and this should be no surprise, we're going to be looking at truth. At each stage of this, we've already said, okay, truth is starting to become wobbly. With objectivity, we said, is this worth looking at rather than is this true? For universality or pragmatism now, we're saying, okay, does this achieve the end I want rather than is this true? So we would expect as we move in the next video on to looking at truth that we're going to have some rather significant um, uh, changes to the enlightenment vision of science must be seeking and finding truth with certainty because we now suspect that science may be doing something else. It's also worth pointing out just while we're here, although this is a course on science and religion, I haven't in the last however many videos since David was talking about religion, right? We, we put that one to bed. I haven't talked about religion so far, right? That's just sitting over on the edge here. So this is not a religionist attacking religion to pull it apart. This is simply a looking at what science is. It unraveled itself quite aside from any help from religion. So once we've now looked at science and having previously at the beginning of the lecture series looked at religion we're then going to be able to to put them together afresh because at the moment we really haven't had them interact that much that will come afterwards <laughs>